Welcome to another edition of Come Follow Me, Doctrine and Covenants, section 58 and 59. Among the gems that we will be discussing this week are the Lord's feelings about the glorious Sabbath day. We'll have a chance to practice that every week in the calendar, improving our Sabbath day worship of the Savior Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked about missionary work a lot and the Lord's instructions about missionary work. But once again, we get a little hint from the Lord that missionary work was just beginning. The church is 16 months old, just brand new. And yet the Lord said from this week's reading, verse 64, the sound must go forth from this place into all the world. The gospel must be preached unto every creature. Brothers and sisters, that is the Lord's mandate. Everyone needs an opportunity to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ being restored again upon the earth. Here's a wonderful short clip from Elder Uchtdorf, who works very closely with the missionary department, giving us an idea for guilt-free missionary work. If, however, you feel that you have been dragging your feet when it comes to sharing the gospel message, may I suggest five guilt-free things. Guilt-free, guilt-free. May I suggest five guilt-free things. First, draw close to God. The closer you draw to our Heavenly Father, the more His light and joy will shine from within you. Second, fill your heart with love for others. This is the second great commandment. Try to truly feel and see everyone around you as a child of God. Third, strive to walk the path of discipleship. As your love for God and His children deepens, so does your commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Talking with others about your faith will become normal and natural. Will become normal and natural. In fact, the gospel will be such an essential, precious part of your lives that it would feel unnatural not to talk about it with others. Fourth, sharing what is in your heart. Look for opportunities to bring up your faith in natural and normal ways, natural and normal ways with people both in person as well as online. There are many normal and natural ways to do this, from daily acts of kindness to personal testimonials on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. In whatever ways seem natural and normal to you, share with people why Jesus Christ and His Church are so important to you. And pray not only for the missionaries to find the elect. Pray daily with all your heart that you will find those who will come and see, come and help, and come and stay. Fifth, trust the Lord to work His miracles. Understand that it's not your job to convert people. That is the role of the Holy Ghost as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I bless you with the confidence to be a living testimonial of gospel values, with the courage to always be recognized as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Wasn't that great guilt-free missionary work by just being normal and natural? Let's say you go to work on a Monday morning. Someone asks you, how was your weekend? Oh, it was great. I went to church. Really? What church? What did you do? What was the topic? What did you study? Somebody sees you on a Friday. How was your day last night? Oh, it was so great. We knelt down and we read the scriptures together as a family and then prayed. What? You pray as a family? 
normal and natural ways. One of the things that this week's reading talks about is trials. So I want you to be thinking about what are some of the trials that you've had in your life? Family concerns, communication problems, money struggles, health issues, relationship troubles, lack of relationship troubles. I wonder if the Lord's counsel in section 58 can help us. He said in verse 3, something shall follow after much tribulation. In the next one, after much tribulation comes. Wait a minute. What is it that's connected with tribulation? What does the Lord tell? Okay, I, I'm, I'm having all of these trials. I'm having struggles and family and home and health and money. And what's going to come? What's the promise? What's the invitation from the Lord? The answer, glory. Glory shall follow after much tribulation. And after much tribulation comes crowned with much glory. Brothers and sisters, it seems to be that as we work our way through trials and struggles with the Savior's help, that the promise is glory on the other end of it. But what if I quit? What if I quit in the middle of the trial? I'll throw my hands in the air and say, no, nope, I'm done. I'm done with Jesus. I'm done with his church. I'm done with this. I'm done with that. I'm also done with the, the crown of glory that the Lord is promising to those who make it through the tribulation with his help. Here's a doctrine that the Lord seems to be teaching very clearly in today's reading. You'll notice I've got a verse from section 58 and one from section 59. If you keep my commandments, whether in life or in death, he that is faithful in tribulation, faithful through those trials, the reward of the same is greater in the kingdom of heaven. But learn that he that doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in the world and eternal life in the world to come. Another way of putting this doctrine is endure to the end. We cannot give up. The Lord is in, he knows we're going to have trials and troubles and tribulations. He tells us you're going to have much tribulation. Glory is coming, but you have to endure through the end. You can't quit in the middle of the trial. You can't throw in the towel and say, I'm giving up. So hang in there. The Lord will bless you. And there are great promises. I've put together a little video clip that I've used before. I'm using it again now. I'm going to add one from Elder Renlund from just this last conference. But the teaching is, is through his atonement, Jesus Christ compensates for all injustice. Knowing that there would be mortal pain and even unspeakable tragedy, because of the abuse of agency. We understood that this could leave us angry, bewildered, defenseless, and vulnerable. But we also knew that the Savior's atonement would overcome and compensate for all of the unfairness of mortal life and bring us peace. For those who think the trials they face are unfair, the atonement covers all of the unfairness of life. With confidence, we testify that the atonement of Jesus Christ has anticipated and in the end will compensate all deprivation and loss for those who turn to him. Faith, Andrew Hall smiled. I discovered faith, and faith led to hope. And faith and hope gave me confidence that one day everything would make sense, that because of the Savior, all the wrongs would be made right. That Jesus Christ both understands unfairness and has the power to provide a remedy. Nothing compares to the unfairness he endured. Because Jesus Christ endured the infinite atoning sacrifice, he empathizes perfectly with us. He's always aware of us and our circumstances. In the eternities, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ will resolve all unfairness. We understandably want to know how and when. How are they going to do that? When are they going to do it? To my knowledge, they haven't revealed how or when. What I do know is that they will. In unfair situations, one of our tasks 
is to trust that all that is unfair about life can be made right through the Atonement of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ overcame the world and absorbed all unfairness. I testify that if we just hang on, like it says in section 122, just hold on. If we just hold on, then the Lord will make it right. We never have to hold on alone. Think of a storm and maybe you're about to be thrown overboard on a boat, but you're clutching to the railing and you think, I don't know if I can hold on. I'm going to let go. I, the storm is beating me. It's pulling me. I don't know if I can hold on. But what we haven't noticed is while we were holding on to the railing, thinking we're going to be washed overboard, Jesus slipped over and buckled us in with carabiners and a lifeline and attached it securely to the boat. And we, oh no, I'm going to let go. I'm going to, I, I can't hold on. I can't hold on. And Jesus says, no, I, I, I've got you. You keep giving your effort and I've got you. You're right here. I'm right here. What a promise from the Lord. I love this teaching from section 58. It is not meet that I should command in all things. We shouldn't have to be told every little thing to do. He that is compelled in all things, the same as a slothful and not wise servant. The Lord wants us to look around. He wants us to see things that need to be done. I love this principle. We have opportunities to practice it all of the time. We might be driving along and we see a neighbor's yard that needs to be mowed. We know that there are circumstances in their family that are keeping them from yard work. How easy it is to just run over with the lawnmower and mow their lawn. But there, I don't minister to that family. Surely that's not my job. Uh, it is not me that I command in all things. And if the Holy Ghost whispers it, we ought to do it. We don't have to be commanded in all things. One of the invitations from the Lord in section 58 is to repent of our sins. And this is the way that you can know that you've repented of your sins. Behold, he will confess those sins and forsake those sins. We need to confess them and forsake them. And then the Lord has the promise, I, the Lord, remember them no more. Just a quick side note before a great little short clip from President Oaks. Side note, we are supposed to remember our sins. The Lord says, I remember them no more. And he's perfect. But some ability through his atoning sacrifice, I am sure, he has the ability to not remember our sins anymore. But we're supposed to remember the stupid mistakes we make so that we don't repeat them. If a child touches a hot surface on the stove and then they forget, oh, the stove is always hot, then they'll constantly be burning themselves. We're supposed to remember, and the Lord promises, if we confess and forsake, he will forget. Here's President Oaks. To be cleansed by repentance, we must forsake our sins and confess them to the Lord and to his mortal judge where required. Alma taught that we must also bring forth works of righteousness. We need to partake of the sacrament each Sabbath day. We need to partake of the sacrament each Sabbath day. We need to partake of the sacrament each Sabbath day. In that ordinance, we make covenants and receive blessings that help us overcome all acts and desires that block us from the perfection our Savior invites us to achieve, to become holy without spot. What a promise. What a miracle. What a blessing. As we all know, repentance is plan A. We need the Savior. We need repentance. We need the atonement of Jesus Christ. But the long-term goal is that we become the kind of person that obeys. Look at the reading. I've sent you that you might be obedient. Blessed are they whose feet stand upon the land of Zion who have obeyed my gospel. And they shall be crowned with blessings from above and with commandments not a few. Obey, and I'm giving you more commandments. Commandments not a few. And I've thought about that. Wait a minute. If I obey, shouldn't the Lord trust me and give me less commandments? No. The more you obey, the more I'm going to bless you with commandments. And I've thought a lot about that. How are commandments blessings? How is obedience and then getting more commandments a blessing? 
Well, the prophets have said some things on this, and I'd like to share a clip or two. What is the covenant path? First is the nature of our obedience to God. More than simply having good intentions, we solemnly commit to live by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. We feel accountable to God for our choices and our lives. We take upon us the name of Christ. We're focused on Christ, on being valiant in the testimony of Jesus, and on developing the character of Christ. With covenants, obedience to gospel principles becomes rooted in our very soul. What a glorious promise. He that keepeth God's commandments receiveth truth and light, till he's glorified in truth and knoweth all things. My brothers and sisters, the great test of this life is obedience. We will prove them herewith, saith the Lord, to see if they will do all things, whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them, declared the Savior. For all who will have a blessing at my hands shall abide the law which was appointed for that blessing and the conditions thereof as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. No greater example of obedience exists than that of our Savior. Of him, Paul observed, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. The Savior demonstrated genuine love of God by living the perfect life, by honoring the sacred mission that was his. Never was he haughty, never was he puffed up with pride, never was he disloyal, ever was he humble, ever was he sincere, ever was he obedient. When faced with the agony of Gethsemane, where he endured such pain that his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground, he exemplified the obedient son by saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. As the Savior instructed his early apostles, so he instructs you and me. Quote, follow thou me. Are we willing to obey? The knowledge which we seek, the answers for which we yearn, and the strength which we desire today to meet the challenges of a complex and changing world can be ours when we willingly obey the Lord's commandments. I quote once again the words of the Lord. He that keepeth God's commandments receiveth truth and light until he's glorified in truth and knoweth all things. It is my humble prayer that we may be blessed with the rich rewards promised to the obedient. I think it goes a little bit like this. When you obey, you get blessings. One of those blessings is with commandments, not a few, meaning more commandments. So you obey, you get blessings. One of those blessings is you get more commandments. Have you ever considered how are more commandments a blessing? Well, the more commandments we get, the more trust the Lord is showing us. Let me give you just a quick, silly example of how more commandments has meant more blessings in my life. Growing up in Southern Utah, one of the things I did to earn a little extra side money was I mowed lawns around the neighborhood. And I loved to take my shirt off and mow lawns and soak up the sun. And I would get really tanned. Then in 1980, I went through the St. George Temple and received my endowment from God. And as a part of that temple endowment, I took upon myself the wonderful blessing of being able to wear the temple garment. 
what I did in the promise of wearing the temple garment is to wear the authorized garment both night and day as instructed in the endowment. In other words, I could never again for the rest of my life mow a lawn with my shirt off because of the promise that I had made in the temple. So, more commandments. But how is that a blessing? I cannot tell you the wonderful power and blessings, both spiritually and even on a couple of occasions physically, that the temple garment has been in my life. I am so grateful for the additional blessings that obedience to my promise to wear them as instructed in the endowment has brought me in my life. So, more obedience led me to the temple. The temple gave me more commandments. Those more commandments led me to more blessings. If you think about the Sabbath day and just go to Pinterest, you're going to find lots of little quotes. Now, some of them, like this one, are great because they actually have a full reference. Oh, this was on October of 2016. This is what President Eyring taught. This is a great quote from Elder Bednar. Should have had a reference. I've often taught my students in my Teachings of the Living Prophets class, a quote without a reference is called Pinterest. Well, let's use a few references and starting right with the scriptures. Section 59, the Sabbath day is intended to keep you unspotted. It's a commandment to go to the house of prayer on the Sabbath day. Oh, I feel closer to God in nature than I do in church. I'm sorry, that's not an excuse. It's a commandment to go to the house of prayer on my holy day. And I love that, my holy day. The Sabbath is not my day, it's the Lord's day. It's a day to rest from your labors, but not the Lord's labors. We are to do the work of the Lord on the Sabbath day. It's the Lord's day. We're to offer our oblations, which it says in your footnote, time, talents, and abilities. Give the day to the Lord and thy sacraments. Let thy food be prepared with singleness of heart. I grew up in a home where Sunday dinner was the biggest, most elaborate meal of the week. And then I got married, and I remember early on in my marriage on one Sunday, I said, Michelle, what are we having for dinner? It was tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. I I was used to mashed potatoes and gravy and corn and jellos and pies and cakes and ice cream. And I think Michelle's family had the right idea. Let thy food be prepared with singleness of heart. Why are we making ourselves or our spouse or our kids work hard for this elaborate meal on the Sabbath day? When really the Lord's command is, no, just let it be simple. The prophets have focused a lot on the Sabbath day. Here's a couple of quotes on the Sabbath day that you may remember. Elder L. Tom Perry, the pattern of the Sabbath day observance must always include worship. Partaking of the sacrament is the center of our Sabbath day observance. What a joy it was last year during the heart of the pandemic to bless and pass the sacrament to my own family in my living room. What a blessing. I rejoice now that in my ward, we're back to going to church every week. What a blessing that is to help keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Elder Perry also made this observation that we need to be careful to avoid such worldly distractions of businesses and recreational facilities. Uh, Athletic competitions and other pursuits may take us away from Sabbath day worship and the opportunity to minister to others. The adversary succeeds when we relax our commitments to the Savior on the Sabbath day. We need to make sure the Sabbath day is focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, it's his day. President Hinckley, the Sabbath day is becoming the play day of the people. It is the day of golf and football on television, of buying and selling in our stores and markets. Are we moving to mainstream America as some observers believe? In this, I fear we are. What a telling time it is to see the parking lots of markets filled on Sunday in communities that are predominantly Latter-day Saints. Our strength for the future will be weakened if we violate the will of the Lord in this matter. We cannot disregard with impunity that which he has said. 
I think we need to consider carefully what Elder Perry and President Hinckley taught us about shopping on the Sabbath day. Elder Holland gave in 2019 a phenomenal test of Sabbath day observance. Listen carefully as he teaches us. Our modified Sunday service is also to reduce the complexity of the meeting schedule in a way that properly emphasizes the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We are to remember in as personal a way as possible that Christ died from a heart broken by shouldering entirely alone the sins and sorrows of the human family. Inasmuch as we contributed to that fatal burden, such a moment demands our respect. Such a moment demands our respect. Such a moment demands our respect. Thus, we're encouraged to come to our services early and reverently, dressed appropriately for participation in a sacred ordinance, the sacred ordinance. Sunday best has lost a little of its meaning in our time, and out of esteem for him into whose presence we come, we ought to restore that tradition of dress and grooming when and where we can. As for punctuality, a late pass will always be lovingly granted to those blessed mothers who, with children and Cheerios and diaper bags trailing in marvelous disarray, are lucky to have made it to church at all. <laughs> Furthermore, there will be others who unavoidably find their ox in the mire on a Sunday morning. However, to this latter group we say, an occasional tardiness is understandable. But if the ox is in the mire every Sunday, then we strongly recommend that you sell the ox or fill the mire. <laughs> in that same spirit, we make an apostolic plea for the reduction of clamor in the sanctuary of our buildings. What a fantastic quote. I hope that we will always wear our best, be early to church, and be reverent when we arrive. President Oaks said, I think, one of the most profound things that's ever been said about the sacrament and sacrament meeting. We go to sacrament meeting to partake of the sacrament. How sad to see persons violating that covenant to remember the Lord in the very meeting where they're making it. Are we distracted in our sacrament meeting? Brothers and sisters, the things that could distract us during sacrament meeting is an endless list. It's time to look inside ourselves and say, how can I make sure for that one hour long meeting that I am focused on the Savior and I'm not allowing myself, yes, agency, I'm not allowing myself to be distracted from the Savior Jesus Christ during this important meeting. President Nelson has been a champion of the Sabbath day. In 2015, President Nelson asked us, what sign do I want to give God? May I invite you also to examine your feelings about and your behavior on the Sabbath day. I am intrigued by the words of Isaiah, who called the Sabbath a delight. Yet I wonder, is the Sabbath really a delight for you and for me? I believe he wanted us to understand that the Sabbath was his gift to us, that my conduct and my attitude on the Sabbath constituted a sign between me and my Heavenly Father. With that understanding, I no longer lead it, needed lists of do's and don'ts. We counsel parents and children to give highest priority to family prayer, family home evening, gospel study and instruction, 
and wholesome family activities. Such study of the gospel makes the Sabbath a delight. In addition to time with family, you can experience true delight on the Sabbath from family history work. Make the Sabbath a delight by rendering service to others. Not pursuing your own pleasure on the Sabbath requires self-discipline. You may have to deny yourself of something you might like. If you choose to delight yourself in the Lord, you will not permit yourself to treat it as any other day. Routine and recreational activities can be done some other time. True believers keep the Sabbath day holy. In this most recent General Conference, Elder Bednar said this about the President Nelson question. President Nelson's simple but powerful question emphasizes a principle that cuts through any uncertainty about what it means and what we should do to honor the Sabbath. I pray that we will keep the Sabbath day holy. One other verse from section 59 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments. Twice, President Monson gave talks on an attitude of gratitude in his 2010 talk where he said, ingratitude be numbered among the serious sins. So it's not just a matter of, well, I'm not ungrateful. If you're not showing gratitude, then you actually might be committing a serious sin. I think that's really important to remember. We need to go out of our way to show gratitude and to be grateful for God. Every one of our prayers should be heartfelt thanks to the Lord for his goodness in our life, filled with gratitude for so many things in our lives. Not just a quick thanks, thanks, and here's my list of wants, but we need to confess God's hand in all things. And then that thread again, obey the commandments.